chances are everything that you've heard about Sidewalk Labs and Toronto is probably wrong. Between the multiple conflicting groups, you have the tech industry here in Toronto, you have the privacy advocacy groups, you have the real estate speculators and investors, you have Waterfront Toronto, City Hall, and Sidewalk Labs itself. There has been a lot of conflicting reports which has made it difficult to see what is fake and what is reality. So transparency has been a serious issue for this Google venture, and you probably feel a lot like this, standing outside, looking in, wondering what's happening behind closed doors. So today we're going to talk about what you need to know about Sidewalk Labs and what do they want from Toronto. Hey Google, what do you really want from Toronto? I do most of my exploring online, so I've seen maps of Toronto. Thanks Google. So first of all, nothing has been set in stone. As of June of 2019, Sidewalk Labs has sent a 1500 master innovation proposal document to Waterfront Toronto to be voted upon on October 31st, 2019. So here are some of the things which were considered absolutely insane. And for someone that lives in Toronto, none of these things were gonna fly. First, the headliner was that they wanted to expand right away outside of the Quayside area, and they wanted to expand to the rest of the 190 acres of the Eastern waterfront, which, you know, that goes way beyond the mandate of the project that was being considered. They also wanted to have their own city administration with their own law enforcement. They also wanted to have the capability to administer their own park systems and the capability to develop their own sewer systems. Google also wanted to own all the patents that were being developed for all the data harvesting that they planned to do in the Keyside area. In hindsight, all of these outrageous requests were just simply negotiating tactics. Negotiating 101 says you try to aim for the moon, just throw at the, everything at the wall, see what sticks, and then you know, compromise in the middle. So that is clearly what they're doing here. This is still an ongoing story. All parties are still negotiating, and we're going to see the end result of all of this on March 31st, 2020. Our objective is to require that the control and collection of data in the project will be democratically accountable. The only thing that's 100% certain is that Google had won the RFP back from Waterfront Toronto back in 2017. And I just want to remind you what the world was like back then. So Trump had just started his presidency and tech was being seen as something to be welcomed into our homes. Apple had just announced their new expansions to HomeKit. Amazon and Google had just started to gain traction with their voice assistants. This was before they both went crazy and wanted to install microphones into everything. Back in 2017, Facebook was seen as a respectable company to work for. Fast forward to 2019, North America has witnessed multiple different ways how data can be weaponized against the general population. And after that major data breach, your personal information, Equifax, is now paying a record amount. Then we had the American companies like Facebook, which were a part of the Cambridge Analytica scandals revolving around selling the data to the highest bidder. And that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake. And I'm sorry. Which eventually ended up going to agencies which attempted to psychologically manipulate voters for the American 2006 election. A currently ongoing news story is we have China using whatever tech they can use to data mine everything they can find about their population and people abroad. This is all to help create their new social credit system being implemented nationwide in 2020. The short version is that this is a way for the Chinese government to find out who is a problem and take them out now to prevent much larger problems for the Chinese government in the future. In fact, let me show you how it works. You can get a better score by doing positive things like volunteering in your community. And you can receive a negative score by breaking laws such as jaywalking. Facial recognition catches jaywalker, actually a bus. A facial recognition system in China proved that it definitely recognizes faces, even ones on the side of a bus. Now that person that was on that bus was obviously a famous person, but if the AI did something wrong, how would someone like you or me be able to fight against the Chinese government or Google? If you get a low enough social credit score, the Chinese government can blacklist you, which does a lot of different things to hinder your quality of life. They can prevent you from taking flights or going onto high-speed trains. They can prevent you from purchasing luxury goods, and they can also remove your ability to go onto the internet. This credit makes it hard to get a job or put kids in top schools. The social credit system will go nationwide next year, and few here are willing to criticize it. The idea is to paralyze and isolate individuals which might be able to harm the Chinese government. And now, if you really wanted to blow up your Chinese social credit score, well, there's an easy way to do that. You just have to violate one of the three T's, acknowledging Tibet, acknowledging Taiwan, or acknowledging Tiananmen Square. 
you could probably add two more onto this list of things. We can also show your support for the Hong Kong people, or you can claim that you're Muslim. Across the northwestern province of Xinjiang, an estimated one million Chinese Muslims have vanished into a vast network of detention centers for what China calls re-education. Shocking vision has emerged of shackled prisoners in a mostly Muslim region of China. The blindfolded detainees are from China's minority Uyghur Muslims, a European security source has told Sky News. China has denied widespread reports of concentration camps. Let's bring it back to Toronto. Now, I want to show you how data can be used against you here today. In fact, I want to tell you the story about how I got my car insurance. A lifetime ago, I used to work at one of the largest financial institutions here in Canada. And as an employee for one of these financial institutions, every day they would drill into our heads that the, our only main objective, the ultimate objective, was to protect the shareholders of the company. We got a new car. So let's talk about how the car insurance gets data from you. 16, 16 year old Mike, my parents had always told me that it was always gonna cost a crazy amount of money to have like have me insured for their car, be a second driver, like five or six or seven thousand dollars a year. Which, you know, 16 year old Mike, that's like a lot of money. I didn't want to spend that amount of money on uh, car insurance, so I just never bothered to, for the last 17 years of my life, I never bothered to look for car insurance. When like she had to get this car insured, you know, one way how insurance companies try to get data from you is they just straight up ask you a whole bunch of questions. So one of the questions they asked is, do you live with anyone that has a driver's license? So that was a whole like string of chain of events which made them do this whole questioning period of like, who am I? I send in my driver's license so they can check my record and all this stuff. So this actually made Venus and I very scared because, you know, we're texting each other and we're just like, uh, you know what? We don't know how much it's going to cost more for her and we don't know if we can afford it. So to add my name on her insurance, guess how much that costs? I'll give you a couple seconds, you know, just put it, leave a comment below. Guess how much my insurance would cost? It costed only one dollar a month. So the last $1 seven- One dollar more. One dollar more a month. I was living under a lie for like the last 17 years of my life. <laughs> that kind of sucks. Now, the second way how to get you know, the data out of you is they offered Venus this plan. You can install this app on your phone and they'll discount you $3 off your insurance per month. But this app that they're gonna install is going to monitor everything that you do for like a 12 month period. Like it's a severe privacy overreach because it'll like monitor everything. If you're not even driving, it's still gonna monitor like all your movements, through the, um, I guess, the accelerometer and the gyroscope. On my brother, he, they actually installed like a device in his, uh, like some type of gadget in his car and it monitored him for like 12 months. By the time he had to renew his insurance, uh, so they increased the premium by $200 more a year. And the reason they could do that is because they had hard evidence that this is how you drive, this is how you do things. And because they have all this data set just sitting there, like you can't fight it. And, you know, and obviously these insurance companies can share this data with whoever they want because you know that's actual data that people can just buy. You don't own that. It's the insurance company that owns that. So don't think it's, that's just generally not a very good idea. So judging from the last comments I've made about an insurance company just a second ago, you can probably tell that this video is not sponsored and I don't plan to get sponsored or do advertising on this channel anytime soon. What I am here to announce is I'm launching a new Patreon because I feel like that is the best way to have the most honest journalistic integrity for these type of videos. It takes me roughly about two weeks to create these type of videos and with the donations you guys can provide, I can continue to create better and better content as we continue moving forward. So that's all I want to say about that. I'll leave the link below and let's move on to the next thing. Now that you've heard all these stories, what does this have to do with Sidewalk Labs? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that the ultimate goal is to develop data harvesting technologies to be used in real world situations. Uh, Toronto is supposed to be the beta test ground for all this tech, at which they're looking to implement all over the world. 
The entire Sidewalk Labs project really hinges on how much you trust Google and its parent company Alphabet as a corporation. In fact, there's a fun thing that you can do on your phone right now. If you open up your phone, go to Google Maps, which I'm gonna do right now, hit the, t I guess the menu button and go to your timeline. If you have location settings turned on as always, then you'll have a complete list of everything you've ever done since the last time you turned that off. To complicate that, you can also program your home address, you can program your work address, and suddenly Google has an overall view of everything you've done in your life. Every place that you've been, every place that it's... I think it's actually really, really crazy, and you know, it's a huge privacy overreach. And luckily, if you have an iPhone, that default behavior is actually turned off. Yeah, in fact, this is probably something that's terrifying for any of you privacy advocates out there. Google was just caught harvesting a whole bunch of medical data from hospitals across the United States. Now, if you combine the anonymous hospital data with the location tracking stuff that they're already doing, you can see where I'm going with this. It's not a good look for Google. So, Melissa, it's called Project Nightingale, Google's new initiative. Companies collecting the personal health information of millions of Americans across 21 states. Data like lab results, doctor diagnoses, and hospitalization records, as well as patient names and dates of birth, also recently agreed by Fitbit, value in that company at about $2 billion. I mean, it's one thing to have UNH, it's one thing to have your doctor's office, have your medical, it's entirely something different to have Google and God only knows what they're gonna do with it. And they can say we're in compliance with it, but it's just not a good look in my opinion. So why do business with Google? We already know they're after the data. So here are 15 essays from, I guess, influential people all across Toronto, from the former city planner to entrepreneurs to like people, at you know, professors from universities, 15 different essays. I'll just summarize it really quickly. Investors want property values to rise. We have the tech industry that wants, if Google moves into Toronto, that it will invite all the tech talent from around the world to live here and work in the tech industry here. And the biggest thing which everyone's thinking about is that if Google doesn't develop the tech here in Toronto, they will probably develop the tech somewhere else. So why don't we have a hand on the wheel of how this tech gets developed and perhaps we can make something good for the local economy. So that's pretty much what you need to know today about Sidewalk Labs. In the next four to five months, we'll have a final negotiation agreement thing that's gonna happen between the government and uh, Google. And then we'll just take a look again back in the near future. Thank you guys for watching. Remember to like and subscribe and check out that Patreon link down below because I would like to continue making more videos like this and I can't do it without your guys' help. Okay, thank you guys for watching. Cheers, bye. Our stated mission is to organize the world's information. China is one-fifth of the world's population. I think if we were to do our mission well, we have to seriously think about how we do more in China. This letter obtained by the New York Times that was signed by many, many, many employees. We urgently need more transparency, a seat at the table, a commitment to clear and open processes. Google employees need to know what we're building. Um, talk to us a little bit about the reaction to this meeting so far. I know that the comment started leaking out almost immediately.